continue to publish stuff, but it's about 1% of what we were given. As far as I can see, um, you've had 58,000 files, so you're telling this committee that only 1% of the information in those files has now gone public. Yes. There is one file which we hold jointly with the New York Times, which is obviously in New York. There were four different sets of information that went to four different parties in four different con countries in three different continents. We were told that 850,000 people, because this goes to the original leak, which is obviously the thing that people are most concerned about, uh, that 850,000 people had access to the information that a 29-year-old in Hawaii, who wasn't even employed by the American government, had access to. So these 850,000 people, this was a figure given to you of people who've got security clearance or they would know what was in the, the, the files these, that you had? I mean, obviously people were aghast. I think people at GCHQ were aghast that a 29-year-old in Hawaii, not even employed by the American government, could get access to their, uh, their files. And I was told the figure of 850,000 people who had that kind of access. The point is that twice in the last three years, these giant databases that were created after 9-11 uh, have proved porous. The, these secret things have escaped, uh, and that is because so many people have access to them. Uh, that is the only point that I think we were trying to make. Do you recognise what you have done? Do you accept that this has damaged the country? Because this is severe criticism that I haven't seen before from the head of our security services. Well, uh, I think it is important context that, that editors of probably the world's leading newspapers in America, the Washington Post and the New York Times, took virtually identical decisions. Uh, so this is not a rogue newspaper. It is serious newspapers who've had long experience of dealing with national security. Uh, the, the problem with these accusations is that they tend to be very vague. Uh, and they're not rooted in specific stories. We've published no names and we've lost control of no names. It's never been a secret that these documents contain names. Uh, a lot of them are PowerPoint presentations given by named individuals. From the beginning of June when we published the first presentation, we redacted the name of somebody. Uh, it was apparent that these documents had names uh, and when the material was uh, seized off uh, David Miranda, uh, under the terror laws, uh, it's apparent from the witness statements that the government knew then, although I would say they knew already, and in fact we discussed the use of names with the cabinet secretary when he visited us in, in mid-June. So there's been six months when it's been apparent that there have been names in these documents. Mm. And has anyone asked you to destroy this information or hand it over? Well, it is a matter of public record that the cabinet secretary came and asked me to destroy the, uh, the, the entire cache of documents. So yes. Right. But you haven't done so? No, that is also a matter of public record. I love this country. Do you love this country? <laughs> How do you answer that kind of question? <coughs> we live in a democracy. Um, most of the people working on this story are British people who have families in this country who love this country. I'm, I'm slightly surprised to be asked the question, but yes, we, we are patriots. Uh, and one of the things we are patriotic about is the nature of the democracy and the nature of a free press and the fact that one can in this country uh, discuss and report these things. By the way, I don't think there is an editor on earth who uh, offered this material would have sent it back unseen. Uh, and most editors, I, I, we asked 30 <coughs> editors, uh, leading editors in the world, to talk about this difficulty of handling, handling secret material and they were all familiar with doing it they all said they would have done what The Guardian did. From your own newspaper on the 2nd of August, which is still available online, because you refer to the fact that GCHQ has its own pride group for staff. And I suggest to you that the data contained within the 58,000 documents also contain data that allowed your newspaper to report that information. It is therefore information now that is not any longer protected under the laws of this country, and that jeopardises those individuals, does it not? Uh, you completely lost me, Mr Ellis. The, the, there are gay members of GCHQ. Is that a surprise? <laughs> and that they have a, that they have They're a, not entitled... <laughs> it's not amusing, Mr Rusbridger. They shouldn't, I, have, they I, shouldn't I be outed by you no. in your newspaper. Actually, if you go to the Stonewall website, uh, you can find the same information there. 
I fail to see how that outs a single member of the GCHQ. Well, you said it was news to you, so you know about the Stonewall website, so it's not news to you. Okay, and it's, it was in your newspaper. What, what about the fact that GCHQ organised trips to Disneyland in Paris? That's also been printed in your newspaper. Does that mean that information, if you knew that, information including the family details of members of GCHQ is also within the 58,000 documents, the security of which you have seriously jeopardised? Uh, uh, again, uh, your, your, your references are lost to me. I, the, the, the fact there was a family outing from GCHQ to Disneyland. Did The Guardian pay for flights by David Miranda to courier secret files? We pay for Mr Miranda's flights, uh, which was he was uh, acting as an intermediary between... So you did pay for those flights. So have they been accounted for as a business expense, those flights? Is the UK taxpayer funding a tax break for the transfer of stolen files? Uh, if you may not be familiar with the tax laws. Uh, so I think we'll move on to our next well, I don't question. See why you should Order on. Mr Ellis. Uh, Paul Flynn. Did you have advance notice of the questions we're asking you today? Uh, <laughs> including yours. <laughs> uh, I wasn't. I was, I was told the general areas of concern that, that, that might be covered. Do you think the reaction of government was less to do with security and more to do with the fact that we have traditionally been neurotically secretive? Well, uh, funnily enough, the, the, the denotice committee that we, we've been talking about earlier uh, had uh, just published their minutes of, uh, of their last meeting in November. So that is a, that is a meeting of the, the press side and the official side. Uh, uh, and it, it, the vice chairman of that body said it was important to distinguish between embarrassment and genuine concerns for national security. The vice chairman felt that much of the material felt published by The Guardian Fell, fell into the former category. So it's, a lot of this stuff is embarrassing because it's come into the public domain rather than threatening to national security. No one has come to me and said, um, this is the specific harm that you've done. Uh, I've, I've seen lots of people who have dealt with the security agencies. I've seen the former Lord Chancellor. I've seen four former Home Office ministers, former Foreign Office ministers, uh, people, who, uh, Paddy Ashdown, who was a former Royal Marine, uh, I've seen people who are serious figures who have dealt with uh, the agencies who say that one should always treat the claims of national security with proper scepticism. I, I think that, that is a proper thing. I'm not claiming to be better placed than the heads of the security uh, agencies. I'm just saying there is a broader debate than just security. And the democracy that I want to live in, uh, I, I don't want yeah. the, the, the national security to be used as a trump card that says, I'm sorry, you can't publish anything else because national security is going to trample that. It's harm versus good. It's authority. Uh, it's proportionality. You know, one one percent, not all of it. Uh, and it's no fishing expeditions. And one of the things I said to the reporters right at the beginning of this is, we're not going to use this as a brand tub for stories. There is stuff in there about Iraq, Afghanistan. We're not even going to look at it. That's not what Edward Snowden was doing when he wanted journalists, responsible journalists, to go through this material. Uh, and so I believe we've abided by those five tests. Are you in touch personally with Mr Snowden? I'm not. You're no. not? But somebody else is on your behalf? Uh, not, not since uh, Mr Greenwald left The Guardian. We, we have no contact with him.